Appreciate the fact that you're here tonight for this very <laughs> special service. This is our Lord's Supper service. We celebrate this as an entire family. We're glad that you're here tonight as we celebrate this time together. Each and every uh, thing on our schedule tonight and our order of service has been planned and prepared to bring us to the place to where we are honoring the Lord and giving Him glory as we partake together. The entire service is focused upon the body of Christ, you and I, melting together, bonding together in remembrance of what the Lord has done. We're going to have some singing, and I'm going to preach and teach out of chapter 11 of the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're going to be there for a little while, and we're going to go right from there. We're going to have an invitation, an opportunity for all of us to examine our hearts and to prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. And after the invitation, we're going to go right in to the elements and the partaking of the elements. We'll go right into that. There'll be no break. They're just go, we're going to go right into that. And we're going to have one uh, consistent service here together. At the end of the service, uh, we will sing together a hymn and we'll go on our way rejoicing in the Lord. But let's ask the Lord to bless our service today in a word of prayer. Then we'll have a great song. We'll stand together. And we're going to be singing nothing but the blood. We're going to sing nothing but the blood. Let's ask the Lord to bless our service tonight. Lord, we love you today and thank you for this opportunity that we can give this entire service to the remembrance of what you have done and your cross work. I pray, Lord, that it be a blessing and a help and a refreshing time as we search our hearts and we partake together that, Lord, we bring you honor and glory with all that is said all that is done. Thank you for the shed blood. Thank you for your broken body. And thank you for these people. Bless them in a mighty way. We ask in your name. Amen. Let's stand together. Nothing but the blood. Sing that out to the Lord. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. <clears throat> No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is a fountain. If you're looking at your book, you just go across the page. Mm -hmm. 
There is a fountain filled with blood Drawn from Emmanuel's vein And sinners plunge beneath that flood Lose all their guilty stains Lose all their guilty stains Lose all their guilty stains And sinners plunge beneath that flood Lose all their guilty stains The dying thief rejoiced to see That fountain in his day And there may I look vile as he Wash all my sin away Wash all my sins away Wash all my sins away And there may I so vile as he Wash all my sin away Dear dying lamb Thy precious blood Shall never lose its power Till all the ransomed church of God Be saved to sin no more Be saved to sin no more Be saved to sin no more Till all the ransomed church of God Be saved to sin no more Be saved to sin. I'm going to look at that. Let's go to, uh, what do we got here, Tracy? What's, what's in the, air sense. Air sense. We're good. Number four. Air sense. Air sense. By faith I saw the stream. Thy flowing wounds supplied. Redeeming blood has been my theme and shall be till I die and shall be till I die and shall be till I die Redeeming blood has been my theme and shall until I die Then this poor list Springs dream, rings tongue, lies silent in the grave. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. I know. Give thanks. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. 
Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord had done for us. Give thanks. We, we are so blessed by the gifts from your hand. I just can't understand why you loved us so much. We are so blessed. We just can't find a way or the words that can say. Thank you, Lord, for your touch. When we're empty, you fill us till we overflow. When we're hungry, you feed us and cause us to know we are so blessed. Take what we have to bring, take it all, everything, Lord, we love you so much. And you may be seated. All right, thank you so much. Let's grab our Bibles tonight, let's go to 1 Corinthians, chapter number 11, please, 1 Corinthians. In your Bibles there, chapter number 11. Let me give you a few thoughts. If I were to title this message, I would say, From the Carnival to the Communion Table. From the Carnival to the Communion Table. You heard just a little bit this morning about what was going on in the church there in Corinth. It was a church that had problems. A church that was saved out of idolatry, saved out of paganism, saved out of all sorts of wickedness. And as they began to grow in their life in Christ... And they begin to gather together. And they begin to partake together. These things that were instructed by the Apostle Paul to the church. There was some things lacking. And so I want to talk to you about the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is designed to be a blessing to you and me. As we're meeting here. We're a corporate body of believers. We've come to focus on the Lord and what He has accomplished. The Lord, the church here in chapter 11, the reality is they've turned the Lord's Supper into a carnival. They were bringing great reproach to the name of Christ and the name of the Lord Jesus in this city became a mockery. Their behavior, their corporate behavior as they gathered together and they partook of the elements, if you will, contradicted the very thing and the very essence of what the cross is supposed to represent. You see, if we look at chapter 11 and verse number 21, we get a little insight to this carnival mentality. It says, And in eating, every one taketh before the other, his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. They were having these church dinners before observing the Lord's Supper. It was just a thing that they did to slap on of whatever they were doing. It became not important. We know that the rich were shaming 
the poor. We see that in verse 22. It says, what? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God? And notice, and shame them that have not? I mean, they just turn this into a spectacle. They turn this into a place of division. The have and the have nots. And that's not what the purpose of the Lord's Supper is. There were divisions in this body. If we know and look at eight, verse 18, there was people that were not getting along and everyone understood this and everyone knew this. It says, first of all, when we come together in the church, I hear that there are to be divisions among you. And I partly believe it. There's heresies among you. Verse 19. There were some problems that were going on. So much that in verse 22, as you get towards the end, they were shaming them to have not. But look at notice else what he said in verse 22 at the end. He says, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. It was not very praiseworthy. And I hope that you got the spirit of this morning's message as to all that we do, all that we say, we should do to the honor and the glory of the Lord. Amen. And so here in verse 23, Paul begins to bring some very much needed teaching, truth, rebuke, warnings to this church that was suffering from the carnival mentality. This is a wonderful text that Paul uses to explain simply to us the meaning of the Lord's Supper. I like that. I'm a simple person. I like things simply. I like things to be understood. And Paul does a great job at helping us with that. He explains what it means to the church, the body of Christ. In fact, this is the only passage where Paul deals with the details of the Lord's Supper and its meaning. Chapter 11, you want to recognize that. You want to know about the Lord's Supper? Go here. We can understand things because of this. There may, there may be all sorts of other ideas. And there's a multiplicity of them about the Lord's Supper. I'm here to tell you, God's Word can help us. And God's word can give us what we need and the knowledge that we need to observe the Lord's Supper together in a worthy manner. We have God's word. And so the Lord's Supper uh, is not a mystical, not a um, spooky religious ritual that many of the religions of the day have made it to be. I'm going to say this probably a couple times, but I'll tell you what, religion doesn't get things right very often. The Bible is true in every page. Religion, not so. So it's not this magical, mystical thing. Every single Christian here tonight should understand the true meaning of the Lord's Supper. I want to just give you four things tonight. From this passage beginning in verse 23. And uh, so we can get a heartbeat about what God was trying to do here. If you notice verse 23, <clears throat> it says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So first of all, I want you to notice that the Lord's Supper was delivered from Paul 
to the church. That's what verse 33, 23 excuse me, is explaining to us very clearly. That Paul received of the Lord. He received a revelation of the Lord. And Paul gave this message about the Lord's Supper to the church. And so we can have some understanding here. Now, Paul was not present when the Lord Jesus met with the twelve in the upper room. That what we kind of know and refer to as the Last Supper. The Last Supper before the Lord went to the cross. Uh, Paul was not there, was he? The Lord Jesus enjoyed the Jewish Passover meal with the twelve. We, we know this in several passages, and we're going to look at that too in just a little bit. But as they were eating, Jesus took this bread and the juice, and the Bible says that he blessed it. Now, Paul was not there in that room at that time. And so, Christ gives Paul a direct revelation concerning this event, and Paul then in turn gives it to the church as a pattern of how and why they should do, or how and why they should uh, partake and, and, and observe, if you will, this event of the Lord's Supper. Now, if we just think about this in a little bit of a manner, we think about that Last Supper. We think about Jesus there with his disciples, and and he gave that Last Supper, that Passover meal. He wanted to eat that with his disciples, and so this was, if you will, given uh, to Israel, but also through Paul here, given to the Church of God, the Body of Christ. And the reason that the Lord gave the Passover to the nation of Israel and the Lord's Supper memorial here to the body of Christ is because it represents the very same thing. The cross work of the Lord Jesus. What he did for you and me, his payment for sins, his shed blood, and the suffering that he did on the cross for you and for me. And so, it's important to understand that, that it was delivered, if you will, to Paul, to give to us. And so, if you will, if you think about the nation of Israel, they got the, uh, if you will, uh, the Passover meal. And it was a prophetic thing for them that that Israel would someday going to be, if you will, uh, a nation where God was going to rule them. And it was for the kingdom, if you will. And, and it was given to Israel so which their sins would be forgiven through what the Lord has done. But we're not in the prophetic program. We're not in the, the prophecy of the nation of Israel. We're in the church age. We're the body of Christ. We're, if you will, we're in the mystery program. This is where God calls on the, the heavenly body of believers, you and I, who are the body of Christ. Uh, the Ephesians says that we've been uh, forgiven, if you will, from all of our sins. And we're seated with him. Ephesians 1, six says we're a fee, uh, seated with him in the heavenlies. We are his body. And so we are his heavenly body and we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And so that's what um, we are here to do. To show Christ's work on the cross. And so guess what? Israel received all of the blessings from the cross, and we will receive all of the blessings from the cross. So we share this memorial between the Passover and the Lord's Supper service. Because it's about His finished work. And so we need to recognize that, that this passage is given to the church. And so we need to be mindful. We need to be thoughtful. We need to be observant of this. And listen to what the Scripture teaches us. So the Lord's Supper was given to the church 
by revelation of Paul. The Lord's Supper also is simply a remembrance. I like simple things. It makes perfect sense to me, and I'm going to share this with you, about how simply we can understand the Lord's Supper is a remembrance of what Christ did on the cross. His finished work on the cross. Look at me in verse 24 and verse 25. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. Notice this phrase, it's simple. This do in remembrance of me. Notice verse 25. In the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as ye drink it. How? In remembrance of me. So not only was it given to the church by Paul, but it's it's just a remembrance, simply a remembrance of what Christ did for you and for me on the cross. Now, isn't it interesting? If you are honest with your human flesh, in your human nature, you would recognize that human nature, man's sinful nature always wants to be able to perform an outward action and based upon that action, somehow receive God's favor. Isn't that like a natural thing in humanity? Hey, I want to work, and if I work, then I'm going to gain more favor of God. Isn't that kind of like, kind of built into the human DNA, if you will? We want to be approved. And so we work, and we do, and we expect favor from God because we've done so, so, so much, and so much. Now, the Lord's Supper is exactly what Paul says. It's a remembrance. And this is why so many religions, I say religions, they've made the Lord's Supper something that it's not. They made it something that is somehow mystical or spooky or uh, a ritualistic is somehow. And somehow that, that, that thing that you do by walking forward and grabbing that wafer from that man, or somehow that somehow brings God's favor into your life. This is what religion does. They take Scripture and they make it for their own devices. Nelson's Bible Dictionary tells us about a few of these different ideas of communion. We have the transubstantiation view. This is held, or the Roman Catholic view, someone we would say, is that is when the bread and the cup, uh, when you take them, they actually become the body and the blood of Christ. When the words of institution are spoken by the priest. So that was their view of communion. When when you take of that wafer, you take of that drink, guess what? Uh, that is actually becoming flesh. Christ, but flesh. His body. And that juice is actually becoming blood. Well, that's kind of not scriptural. So, some folks have gotten out of that we think of somebody like Martin Luther. He left that. So he says, well, we can't have that. we got to do something different. So he didn't go far enough. He's, he's got the consubstantiation view. And now this is Christ's body and his blood are truly present in, with, and under the bread and juice. His presence. They do not actually change into Christ's body, but Christ is present in the elements. And so uh, he... he he says, well, it doesn't really make sense, but let's go this direction. Then we got another one. It's called the dynamic view. This is like those that are in the Presbyterian or John Calvin. This is where Christ is not physically present in the elements, but he is dynamically and spiritually present in the Lord's Supper through the Holy Spirit. So somehow the Lord's Supper brings the body of Christ into these elements. And that elements give spiritual nourishment from the are glorified from his glorified body to those that receive it. Now, even Calvin admitted it's a mystery and he can't figure out how that works. But somehow we believe those things. Religion does a good job, doesn't it? It's amazing how 
religion can complicate things. Religion often loves the mysterious. They love the mysterious. You don't really know about it. You don't really understand about it. They love the mysterious. It might, might go back to the pagan practices of the Babylonian Empire. I mean, it could be, but that Christians have said, oh yeah, just like the carnival, just like those Corinthians were going downtown and, and eating dinner and uh, to, the, to the devil over there, uh, eating the Lord's Supper at the devil's and then come and trying to eat the Lord's Supper. There. Hey, even though that somehow we're just going to associate and assimilate this culture into our church. How many different Christian sects are today probably not even preaching the gospel now because they failed and they brought their culture, their pagan practices, and their former religion into their Christendom. And Paul says, this is a remembrance. This is a remembrance of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Let's turn to Luke chapter 22. I'm going to show you a couple of verses here as we look at this passage in Luke 22. But think with me here now. Isn't it interesting? If a religion cannot explain communion, if they cannot explain this thing, what does it do? It just keeps you, the followers, in bondage to them, and it just keeps you coming back. It just keeps you coming back. Because you don't, you're not sure. You, you don't know. Uh, you don't want to be left out. Uh, you, you want to make sure you got your, your, your ducks in a row. You want to make sure everything is covered. And so guess what? You just keep on coming back. And so you've created something that they have to do in order to be right with God. Now, let's clear away some of this fog of religion. Luke 22, notice with me here, verse 14. The Bible says, And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. How many apostles? Twelve. Very important. And he said unto them, With desire I desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup. He gave thanks and said, "This, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which was given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the cup, after saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. And I'll stop there for a second. Now, Jesus is eating this Passover meal with his disciples. He holds up the bread, he holds up the juice, and he gives it to them, and he tells them exactly what it represents. True? He says, boys, here is the bread, and this represents my body, which is going to be broken for you, and I'm going to suffer that. He holds that other thing up, and he says, hey, so clearly it's symbolic. And you know it's not his physical body because his physical body is holding the bread. <laughs> Jesus says, this is my body. He's holding the bread. He gave it to the disciples. and says, this do in remembrance of me. So clearly, it has nothing to do with what religion says. It is a time where we can have a time of remembrance about what Christ hath already did. Now, look at verse 19. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto him, saying, This is the, my body which is given for you. He says, This represents my body which is given for you. He did the same thing with his blood. Now, it wasn't his literal body because his body was in him. It wasn't his blood because his blood was inside of his body. So it's clearly symbolic, right? That's simple, isn't it? And so we got to clear the way here 
of all of this religion fog and all of these false things about this time tonight. John chapter 6 with me. Go to the next chapter. Look at this. I'm going to show you this. John chapter 6. We're thinking about symbolic things. John 6, verse 35. Jesus said unto them. So Jesus was speaking to his disciples. He says, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So he makes it pretty clear that the eating and the drinking of Christ here, he says, I'm the bread. It's exactly what it says where he he that cometh to me and he that believeth on me. That's what it is. Very clearly here that it's talking about those that come to him. So it's a good idea that you and I, we love the Bible. We believe the Bible. We are Bible believers. And so we should always take the Bible literally unless something is obviously symbolic. There's quite a bit of that in in the Bible. For instance, John the Baptist, he looks at Jesus. He says, behold, the Lamb of God, right? Was Jesus actually a lamb? Symbolic. Clearly, right? Okay. That's simple. We understand that. So we should always take the Bible literally, unless it's pretty obvious. And we, we speak this way all the time. We speak symbolically all the time. Miss Jean, you know what she speaks? She says all the time, Pastor, I'm freezing. She's cold, but she's not an ice cube. Brother Panky says, I'm burning up in here. My head is on fire. It's not really on fire, is it? Maybe. So we speak in these kind of terms quite a bit. Some of you, like Miss Kitty, that like to get speeding tickets, you say, I'm going to fly on home. I'm going to get out of here and I'm flying home. Well, we know exactly what that means, right? It's symbolic. She's going to speed in a school zone is what she's going to do. And she's going to get a ticket, right, honey? So it's obvious that Jesus is speaking symbolically here about this. He's speaking symbolically of the body and the blood. And so when he held up that piece and that bread and that cup... Only religion can confuse it. You read that, you say, simple. Jesus said this is symbolic of what his sacrifice was on the cross. And this was symbolic of his blood. But only religion can say, well, that's actually the body of the Lord. And that's actually the blood of Christ. And somehow, if you partake of those things, somehow you're going to have blessings. And somehow you're going to feel this. Or somehow you're going to do this. So only religion does those things. And so the Bible tells us that it is simply a remembrance of what Christ did for us on the cross. It's so obvious. Now, go back to Luke chapter 22. Here's a thought. Look with me down in verse 20. The Bible says, Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Look at verse 21. Remember I said there's 12 disciples there? Look at verse 21. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. You know who that was. It was Judas, right? So the, this bread and this juice, somehow, in some religion's eyes, comes the very body and the very blood of the Lord Jesus. So somehow, they take of this supper, and it becomes the body and the blood of the Lord. I'll tell you what, it sure didn't help Judas out. 
Here he was. He received the very body, is what some say, of the, uh, of the Lord. And, and he received some divine thing, some divine spiritual ritual. And he goes out and he hangs himself. That didn't help him very much, did it? Because it's rep- it's, it re- represents the cross work. It reminds us of something. It represents something. The broken bread, these two elements, the broken bread and the cup, remind us of the Lord's broken body. That work on the cross, how he was beaten. How his body was mutilated. How it hung on a tree and he bore our sins. The fruit of the vine, that juice that we drink, is to remind us of the blood that he gave for us and how he redeemed us. If we go back to our text in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, notice what he says there in verse 25. After the same manner, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you in remembrance of me. And so simply, let me just tell you, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper is a remembrance, pure and simple. That's it. Pastor, can it mean more? Well, it could do some great things, and I might share a couple of those a little bit later. But as far as defining what it is, it's a remembrance. It's a remembrance. It cannot bring you any kind of special favor. What does the priest say, Joe, when he comes up to you? Bless you, my son, or whatever. He cannot give you any divine blessing, any added favor with God, because it's a remembrance. Because you say, but preacher, doesn't it do anything for me? Now, let me ask you this. I'm just, let's get simple. Can we get simple? Let's be simple. Now, Colossians chapter 2, verse 10 says, if you know the Lord, you say, but ye are complete in him. You're complete in him. So if you know the Lord as Savior, you're complete. Would you agree? So this idea that I need to take this communion to so that I'm full or I have all of or that I need more of, that's totally false thought. It can't gain you more of Christ. It can't give you an upper hand. Because guess what? If you know the Lord, the Bible says you're complete. The Bible says you are in need of nothing. If you are a partaker of the Lord Jesus, you get all the spiritual blessings because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus on the cross. So when you come to Jesus, you believe on Him. You become one with Jesus The Bible says that you are in Christ. He says you are members of His body in Ephesians chapter 5. You're members of His body. And so you don't need to stand in line and and get away for so that you can get more of Christ. So that you can be accepted more. Because this Lord's Supper is a remembrance. Because if that were true, It would mean that we didn't get all of Christ when we got saved. Something lacking. I submit to you, we're not lacking. If you're in Christ, you are in Him. You are seated in the heavenlies. You are blessed with all spiritual blessings. Thank the Lord for that. It would mean that, you know what? Hey, once in a while, i got to do something. i got to eat this physical food here so that I can gain more spiritual power. I'm here to tell you, it doesn't work like that. What does religion do? They teach you this so that you keep coming back, coming back, and coming back. Do they not? They want to control you. They want to be your avenue to the Lord Jesus. Listen, if you know the Lord is your Savior, you are complete in Him. You are in need of nothing. And the church should gather together in remembrance of Him and celebrate this special time. What a blessing that we get to do this. You see, the Bible knows 
nothing of this idea that, well, you'll lose your relationship with the Lord if you don't have this communion. When you believe on the Lord, you become a member of his body. You're one with him. He says you're in Christ. Praise the Lord. That settles it for me. And what the Bible tells me here is it's a remembrance. And so as we gather together and we partake of these elements, we need to remember it's a remembrance. It's a remembrance. Not only is it a remembrance, not only is it given to the church through Paul, but this Last Supper is simply an outward demonstration of my faith and your faith in Christ. When I partake, I am outwardly demonstrating it. Look what he says here in our text in 1 Corinthians 11. Notice what he says here in verse 26. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup. Notice this word. Ye do show the Lord's death. Till he come. It's a demonstration. That word show means to proclaim. Some places in the Bible it says to preach, to declare. And so guess what? As you and I partake tonight and we are declaring something, what are we preaching? What are we declaring? We're declaring a message. What are we declaring with our message? We are proclaiming that you and I have been to Calvary. We've experienced the Lord Jesus. We are saved. We know Him. And we're thankful For his cross work. We're thankful. For what he's done. We're thankful for the body that was broken. We're thankful for the blood that was shed. We're thankful that we can have complete salvation in him. Now notice he says here in verse 26. He says as for as often as ye eat this bread. And drink this cup. Now notice Paul. Remember he's telling us about communion. The Lord's Supper. Remember they were. They were going from the carnival to the communion table. And Paul says, I'm not going to praise you in this. Hey, you're going over here and you're eating at the table of devils and you want to come down and eat at the table of the Lord? Okay, there's a problem here. But as far as, um, if you will, uh, I'm I'm thinking about this word. um, He doesn't lay down hard and fast rules about how specifically to observe it. He doesn't say, okay, you need to have it uh, the fifth Sunday of the month. There's no hard and fast rule about how often. It's not, hey, every Sunday, twice a month, twice a year, six times a year, 12 times a year. No. Paul doesn't do that. He leaves that up to the individual congregation. He doesn't do that. He doesn't say, it's at this time. Every time, this time. He doesn't say who should hand it out, who sh- how it should be distributed, how much bread and juice you're to have, only a little. <laughs> you know, he doesn't say, he doesn't tell us all those little things. But somehow we figured it out, haven't we? <laughs> I'm not, let's just be honest about this stuff. There, there's not a lot of these things, so he leaves a lot of that up to the body of Christ, the local body here. Now, religion tells you, this is how you do it. This is when you do it. This is who gives it. This is who participates. This is what it's all about. Now, notice what Paul says. He just says, you know what? When we do this, you are showing, you are proclaiming, you are preaching the Lord's death till he come. Till he come. That's interesting, till he come. You know, Paul talked about other spiritual gifts and other spiritual things. And he, he talked about, you remember the gift of tongues and it was for a season and a time and it said it will cease, right? You remember that? You know, he says, till he comes. So we're to do this until the Lord comes back. That's the timing. When, how I, I, but we are to do this till the Lord comes back. That's our time frame. So... It's something that you and I, the body of Christ, should do. And what we're doing is we're a time of remembrance. And what we're doing is we are demonstrating and proclaiming what Jesus Christ has done 
on the cross. So not only is it a time that we can demonstrate, it tells us to show, demonstrate. You and I, we're going to show that we've been to Calvary. That we understand the sacrifice. That we understand what it cost. We understand these things. We're not just coming from the carnival. We're not just coming in hungry. We're not just coming saying, you know what, what do you got? What's on the dinner table tonight? This is a time of remembrance, and it's very uh, something that we need to make sure that we do this. And my last, number four, is the Lord's Supper is to be served in a worthy manner. Look at verse 27. How are we to do this? He says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, that's an interesting phrase at the end. We'll get to this. But he says, hey, you don't want to do this. You want to observe this memorial, if you will, this time of remembrance. You want to do it in a worthy manner. Now, listen, I'm here to tell you, my church people, my flock, if you will, you don't need to, uh, 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 you, you don't need to approach this communion table, the Lord's Supper, with fear. You don't need to. Some people do. Well, am I going to get zapped if I'm unworthy? If I, if I, if I didn't get rid of all my sins? And when I did, did I mention all the all the sins I had? Or, you know, I'll hit, somehow I'm going to get zapped. Or something. You don't need to approach this with a, a a spirit, if you will, of fear. You say, but I haven't been living perfect. Yeah, me neither. Did you know that none of us are worthy? None of us have a resume worthy of the Lord's death. But through His grace, we can approach the throne boldly and we can approach this table without fear. I think it's important to look at Scripture in light of context. Would you agree? This is what we preach here. Context is pretty important, isn't it? Now, just think with me here. What's going on in Corinth? It says here, Paul is telling them, listen, listen, You don't want to eat of this bread and you don't want to drink of this cup unworthily because you will be found guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. You don't want that. Okay, so what's going on? What's the context? Well, what were believers doing? Born again believers, they were publicly associating themselves with pagan altars of idolatry. I mean, it was common Practice. Look at what it says in chapter verse 20 of this chapter here. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Um, yeah, they were, they were coming there, and they're going down the street, and they were observing the Lord's Supper. So they're going to the idle place, and they're going down. And they were observing the Lord's Supper while they were... Uh, Shaming poor people, verse 22. They're observing the Lord's Supper in some spiritual manner, but you know what? They divided people based upon their economic wealth. They divided people based upon, if you will, their status. We know what the scripture teaches about how God divides. He doesn't look at color. He doesn't look at, he says there's no bond, no free, no bond, no Scythian, no Jew, no Gentile. What does he say? All of us are all in all if we're in the Lord. So he says the church of God, the Jew, and the Gentiles. That's how he views us. Now, these believers were being gluttonous. They were being drunk. They were hanging out in a public assembly. They were holding grudges. They had bitterness with one to another. Look at what he says in verse 18. First of all, I hear that when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. So these believers were had these grudges against each other and they were separating into uh, divisions and different groups. Stop that. We're, we're a body, we're a family here. There ain't no sides. Stop that. We're family. We operate as a family. Okay? Well, I'm old. Well, yeah, there's some young people too. 
I'm young. Well, there's old people too. We're all a family. We don't need to have the division there. This is what was happening there. And you know what they were doing? They were sinning against one another. Look at chapter 8. I'm going to wrap this up. Chapter 8. You need to see this. They were sitting against one another. And they were sitting against Christ's body. Look what he says in verse 12 of chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians. But when you sin, so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, who are you sitting against? What? You sit against Christ. So this gives us some insight to this passage here. Where he says, you don't want to come and, and eat and drink unworthily. You don't want to have aught against your brother. You don't want to have a problem against one another. Because really, you are sitting against Christ. You see, we can't sit. I hope I'm saying this correctly. We can't sin against Jesus up in his throne room right now. Because that's in his throne. But we can sit against one another down here and when we're down here and we sin against one another we are sinning against the body because we're members one of another in particular and so this is the context this is how we need to understand we can't physically serve the lord jesus he's on his throne room now but we can physically serve him by serving other people who are the body of Christ. So we don't want to be guilty of the body of Christ. Religion takes it weird places. I'm not up on everything. People say things to me and like, I'm like, really? I'm like, all I know is that this is the chapter that Paul tells about how we're supposed to do it. And that's all I know. No, don't you know? I'm like, no, I don't know. This is what I know. But religion loves to mess it up. They'll say, if you don't do it this way, the way they tell you, you're going to be in big trouble. Guess what? We're never going to be worthy in this life. So Christ is what makes us worthy. We've already been, according to Ephesians, we've already been accepted in the Beloved. So that is how we approach the situation. That is how we could partake worthily. And here's the thought, and then we're, we're going to partake together. Paul, in this passage here in chapter 11, they're talking about being worthy to take the Lord's Supper. If you've trusted the Lord Jesus, guess what? You stand before God justified and worthy because you are in Christ. I am in Christ. I think what Paul is discussing here in chapter 11 is the manner in which they observe this memorial. The manner. Unworthily. It's the way that they're observing it. They're bringing public reproach. They're bringing the name of Christ down. They're cheapening it, if you will. It's just another thing. It's just another meal. We're just going to add it on to the, the, uh, the potluck. Oh, yeah, here, here's some bread and here's some juice. After they've already eaten their gluttonous, they've already full, and their focus isn't where it needs to be. And so this is why I, since I became the pastor here, when we have the Lord's Supper, we do the entire service. We talk about the Lord's Supper. Why? Because we just want to make sure that when we're doing it, we're doing it in a worthy manner. Not just, you know what, oh, at the end of the story, come on, ushers, come on down here. Be done. No, we want to focus our hearts on this. Make sure that we are doing it worthily the way that we uh, observe it, if you will. We're celebrating this we're taking this and we are if you will um we're trying to honor the lord in this we don't want this 
Lord's Supper to be a public reproach of the name of Christ at all. And so we don't want anyone sinning against the very ones against one another because that would be, if you will, that would be sinning against the very body of Christ. There's nothing mystical here. It just shows that envy, pride, arrogance, the same thing that led Jesus Christ up the road to Golgotha, away with him. We will have no king. The same thing that said crucify him, crucify him. These same things can be with us. And so let's make sure that our conduct is becoming the remembrance of the Lord Jesus. There's some helpful thoughts for us tonight. We're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to have an invitation. And this is a time for you. This altar is available for you. There might be some things you just need to lay up here to say, I'm giving it to you, God. Lord, uh, Lord, I got this between you. I'm, uh, I'm going to lay it here. I'm going to be done with it. This might be an opportunity for you. And after the invitation, we're going to partake together and we're going to, we're going to experience in this time of remembrance as we fellowship around this table. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would bless this invitation, work in hearts. Help us, Lord. Thank you for these truths that we learned today from your word. Lord, my desire is that you'd get the glory from this. Lord, we are mindful of your sacrifice, your body, the blood that was shed. And Lord, I pray that each and every one of us here would recognize what the Lord's Supper is. And we can go from the carnival to the communion table and partake in a worthy manner because we are in you and we are complete in you. Help us to remember these truths tonight. Let's partake together in a worthy manner. Bless this invitation, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's just kind of stand together. Just stretch our legs for a second. A couple more minutes. Let's not lose sight of what we got going on here. If you need this altar, this is the time. Take this time as the instruments play. Where you're at, whatever it might be, this is the time. Take your things to the Lord and just leave them at the cross.
Thank you for your kind of attention. You may be seated. I'm going to have the men come forward. Thank you, Rick and Jim. 